Hi everyone, I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. Welcome to Tuesday Night Rheumatology. This is our grand round series and tonight we have a real double feature from uh, down under. Um, good friends, good colleagues. I work with these gentlemen every ACR, every ULR. They, and I work with them because they're so good at information gathering and educating everybody on the latest and greatest in rheumatology. Um, Philip Robinson from University of Queensland, Queensland and Peter Nash from Griffith University School of Medicine. Gentlemen, how are you? Hi, Jack. Very well. All right. So um, we want to cover a lot of ground tonight. We're going to have two sort of presentations. Uh, one to review the, the room COVID registry that Philip was instrumental in starting and, um, and then getting a perspective from Peter on uh, COVID from down under in the land of Oz. Um, gentlemen, I want to start off with a question for you. Um, you know, the impact of the coronavirus on rheumatology has been quite tangible. Um, clearly, the impact on healthcare has been very tangible. Um, the estimates are that U.S. hospitals are going to lose $50 billion a month for the first four months of this crisis, and that a recent Medscape survey says that the loss in income and revenue is substantial in American practice with at least a 55% a drop in revenue and a 60% drop in patient traffic um, and visits. Um, I think there's a, there are so many untold consequences of this, but um, um, how is it affecting um, where you guys are practicing and what's your perspective on the, the impact this has had on rheumatologists? Peter, do you wanna start? Well, I think it's had a huge impact. We're doing a lot of telemedicine and many of my colleagues are telling me that they're gonna go bust if that doesn't change over time because it doesn't reimburse them adequately for their time. We're hearing that the patient numbers are down because people are scared. We're hearing they can't get their patients with other important diseases diagnosed and treated because all the public hospitals, the private hospitals have been just about closed to everything except COVID. And what's worse is all the businesses in a small place like where I live on the Sunshine Coast, many of them are gonna to go to the wall because they cannot afford this downturn, uh, even though the government's trying to help. So it's got massive repercussions, economy, small business, the dollars dive, the share market's down across all aspects of medicine. And we'll talk a little bit about some of them uh, in the next little while, Phil. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, the, the things that have really landed and resonated with me are the things that you just don't think people would stay at home with. So stroke physicians saying that their wards are empty. You know, stroke is not a thing that you think that you could sit on. And, you know, talking to pathologists saying that, you know, um, monitoring testing is plummeted and not being able to um, undertake routine things like colonoscopy and endoscopy this is a time bomb. We're not treating our current non-COVID patients and we are accumulating uh, a debt to, that's gonna appear down the road with malignancy and complications that look, I'm frankly slightly scared about. Now in Australia, we've been very lucky that we haven't had a lot of COVID, but we are gonna have exactly the same effect on that non-COVID and uh, I think, you know, if you end up dying of um, stroke or MI or cancer you know, during or shortly after this pandemic because of the impact that the COVIDs have on the health system, I think you are just as much a victim of this pandemic or you're, effect you're affected or you die just as much a, a victim of this pandemic as someone who actually, you know, is affected by directly by COVID. There's you know, even though you... Go ahead, Peter. Sorry, Jack. 400,000 patients on the elective surgery waiting list that, would, that are sitting there waiting for the hospitals to get going again, which they just have. Wow. Uh, I like the idea of non-COVID management. We need to focus on that, you know. Um, and again, the revenues are down, the, the, the traffic's down. But interestingly, in Australia, where you have um, uh, fewer cases, you still have the same impact on this revenue and traffic uh, as, as much yeah. as what's going about the same what's going on in New York City, where it's obviously a, uh, a crisis. 
So um, it's paralyzed patients. And I think maybe the one thing that we should be doing as a discipline uh, and as practitioners is increasing our engagements, increasing our revenue by reaching out to patients. We're assuming they know what to do. Right now, they just know they're not supposed to leave the house. Um, and most of them are misguided about their risk um, so much so they're not, they haven't, I have a whole bunch of patients who haven't left the house in over two months. It's scary. It is scary. Mm. Yeah. And uh, the last number I saw, I saw recently was almost 10% of U.S. practices have closed um, during the crisis, mainly because they didn't know what to do or they, the docs themselves were, were fearful about what may happen next. So, yeah, and um, one, you know, one of the important, yeah, one of the important things is like you, you know, we work off data and that's what we do, right? So we say, okay, the research shows this, so this shows that it's safe. But one of the things that's really hard to do during a pandemic is doing research and collecting good data. So, you know, we've, we're, we're trying to collect data in the best way possible, but, you know, the pandemic is impairing our ability to collect information about it. Peter, you want to say something? Well, just that the, the government ramped up for a huge pandemic, which really hasn't eventuated, luckily, in our country. So everything was shut, everything was closed, borders, hospital wards, fever clinics. They uh, recruited recently retired docs, 5,000 of them, re-registered them all, ready so they could get into the fight against COVID and the pandemic just never came to most parts of the country. Middle of Sydney, middle of Melbourne, that's different. But the rest of the country, that's, that's the kind of extent they went to, to, to get prepared for an eventuality. We've got a, a billionaire here who bought 32 million doses of hydroxychloroquine to donate. His name so is Trump? Do now? <laughs> Sorry? Is his name Trump? <laughs> no, different, different no, billionaire. No. He actually, oh. he actually paid for them. So there's 32 million doses <laughs> sitting in a warehouse. I wonder what's going to happen with that lot. And, and it was unregistered. Yeah, you know, um, it's not registered always... without FDA equivalent. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we say in medicine, when you treat yourself, you got a fool for a patient. What can we say about Dr. Trump? So, um, Let's, uh, let's get on with talking about data. You know, I think that uh, the, what we need is data. What we need is certainty. Um, and um, numbers are our best way in moving forward. So um, uh, Philip was one of the principal leaders and instigators behind the Global Rheumatology Alliance. And we asked him to come on and give us an overview of um, what they have accomplished in a very short time um, and I think it's really quite amazing. I want to remind the audience that to please use the Q&A button throughout the, ta uh, the talks to uh, register your questions that we'll, we will get into in the last 20 minutes of our session today. So, Philip, you could take over. Thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, that's just going to work out how to move forward. All right. Okay. So, those are my uh, conflicts. So look, look. I think we've talked about why a registry, but I suppose it's it's uh, of value to think about the different ways that it, it might be important, or we might be able to think about this. Uh, and you know, everyone's focusing on drugs uh, a lot, but we also have to remember that rheumatic disease potentially uh, presents a risk in and of itself. Uh, now, that's, there's not much we can probably do about that risk, but, you know, our patients have immune dysfunction as a baseline, and then we um, further complicate the matter by introducing immune, uh, immune suppressing or modulating drugs on top of that. And then, really, uh, you know, it's been rheumatology um, front and centre with therapies really you know um it's there's not the time or the i don't have the energy to go into hydroxychloroquine too much today but you know hydroxychloroquine um tocilizumab they've really been front and center of people discussing and we've seen data about anakinra so you know our, our drugs have been uh you know are they are they maybe of value as well so um that's another reason to think about collecting data 
Uh, and really because of the characteristics of the virus, um, SARS-CoV-1 and MERS infections really didn't have the impact. And so they just, we didn't really have any data from these things. So this is a, this is a new space really. Uh, and you know, even if we did have data, it's, it's a different coronavirus and the, the scientists who know much more about this than me say, it, it, you know, even based <laughs> on um, uh, comparisons, we need to be very careful because of the differences in, uh, in these viruses. So all of that really led to um, uh, the need or the want to collect data on our patients who get infected. But I, I want to put front and centre the really important, um, uh, the really important thoughts about the fact that this is really just a grand case registry, a case series that we're thinking about. Now we can do, um, uh, we can try and limit um, the ability to uh, uh, bias, but really where where patients are reported into the registry, uh, and so we need to think about things like selection bias. So, you know, what happened and, and how did this come about? Really, it started with a, a tweet by Len Calabresi uh, to say, look, uh, other people are doing this. Is this of value? And, and then it sort of snowballed from there. And, and you can see um, uh, that's, um, my apologies, it's actually incorrect. That is, um, that is March. Uh, so that it, it took uh, really less than two weeks um, uh, to come on, um, come on stream uh, to uh, to get this registry up and going, uh, and again, I'm getting my months wrong. Sorry, as of um, uh, as of yesterday, we have uh, 1,500 cases, um, uh, and we're probably um, pretty soon because we're uh, going to be at around the 1,800 mark um, uh, because. We're connecting with a whole lot of uh, country-specific registries who are able to give us huge data dumps. So I think very soon we're going to have north of 2,000 patients and, and even more as time goes on. So, um, uh, so the, the registry is really building significantly. So we're doing a number of different things uh, at the registry. We're looking at a few different aspects, but I'm just going to talk about the registry data today. Uh, but we've, we've got other teams of people thinking about other uh, other aspects, including looking at the literature. So uh, we've got a massive team that's um, really contributed to by many, many countries all around the world, uh, 40 countries in the data that I'm going to talk about, and it will be further expanded. So I think this is really a credit to global rheumatology that they've got behind this and recognise the importance of this. So this is a... Um, a representation of the countries uh, that have contributed data. Um, uh, and you can see there's a key on the right there. Um, now this is, again, this is slightly dated, but there's um, significant contributions from Europe uh, and uh, North America, and then uh, a number of other countries, I said 40 other countries. So the data that I'm gonna uh, present really represents um, global, um, global patients. So what information are we collecting? Uh, we're collecting de-identified demographics, uh, diagnoses, uh, so that's uh, physician allocated diagnoses, um, rheumatic drugs that the patients are on up to their infection, comorbidities that they have, uh, the diagnosis and how it was made, including what laboratory test or imaging that was done, uh, labs, and then outcomes. And then we're also collecting reporting details because um, often patients will get reported when their um, infection isn't totally resolved. Uh, and so it's good to be able to try and um, go back and uh, totally resolve all the patients because outcomes are what we're interested in. Fast, you know, getting data, collecting data quickly is important, but also knowing what the uh, eventual outcomes are. So this is the first report that we um, published on the 16th of April. Uh, this was our first 110 patients. Um, and these are 70% uh, female, 
uh, 18 uh, percent over the age of 65 with very typical um, rheumatic disease cohort with lots of rheumatoid psoriatic uh, and uh, lupus with axial SPA and the other um, uh, the other rarer diseases also represented and we saw a broader range a good broad range of con conventional synthetic DMARDs jack inhibitors biologics but you can see that um, sort of 45 percent of patients in this cohort are on biologics so this is probably a more um, a more severe um, cohort, depending on you know local practice trends, um, uh, and and that's probably uh, reflective of the fact that this is a physician reported registry, and patients who maybe have mild disease, uh, they got a swab maybe in the community and went home and self isolated and haven't gone on well, are staying at home and they're not getting in front of physicians and being reported. So that's one thing, certainly one thing to remember when we're looking at this data. So one thing that we, um, uh, you know, that I certainly worry about when I think about immunosuppression is whether patients present in a typical way, whether they um, uh, present with the typical features that we think about or whether they present with atypical features. And this really, I think, demonstrates that they present with fever and cough and shortness of breath, just as we would expect a, a, a non-rheumatic uh, disease patient to present. So this is certainly um, reassuring from that point of view. 35% admitted to hospital, which is um, higher than the, um, than, the, than the general cohorts. But again, we need to think about how this data was collected and 5% um, died in the first 110 patients. And they had pretty typical comorbidities. Um, and this was really our first shot um, to get some data out there that, would, that, that, could, um, that people could have a look at. So, um, and then the other thing that we've been collecting is um, patient data, um, so patient reported data. So um, clearly um, patients who get infected are important, but there are a whole lot of patients out there who are, are at risk. And so we want to know, we wanted to know how they were going and, and how, they were, how they were feeling about this uh, and, and what, what issues they had. The other thing to remember is that we're, this is a mechanism to collect milder cases because if you got your swab at your local lab, you went home, you self-isolated, you've got rheumatoid and you're on methotrexate, you can sit here and complete the physician survey. And so we can get a slightly different cohort of patients. Now, clearly there are limitations in directly asking patients, but there are certainly strengths as well. And so this is the data that, that um, so we've had a huge uptake in this, and this is data on 9,500, but we're well north of 12,000 now, uh, and we're getting further data sets um, brought in. So again, uh, typical um, uh, uh, rheumatic disease group, rheumatoid, uh, lupus, um, axial spa, um, and around 5% have been infected, and that sort of stayed up, and so the... Um, uh, we've got about 750 or so in the, in the 12,000. Um, uh, and there, um, uh, and, you know, this data was very um, informative to be able to uh, publish, publish that, in fact, um, we, patients with, um, with lupus on hydroxychloroquine do get COVID. So that's um, certainly uh, information that we've got from the survey that's been helpful to um, dissuade um, comments that have been made by officials and, and sort of uh, information that's been going around. Um, so this is our second report, uh, which currently is in press and will be out very shortly. Um, uh, so this is data from the physician registry on our first 600 patients. Um, and uh, uh, this, this is again is a typical um, rheumatic disease cohort with 70% females median age 56. Again, the majority collected from North America and Europe, but with a fantastic showing from the, uh, the, the other global countries. And we're now starting to see some other diseases, which um, uh, things like gout and inflammatory myopathy. Um, and if you think now that we're at sort of triple this cohort, you can think that if the numbers hold, then you know, we're starting to develop decent numbers of the, the subgroups as well. Um, that we can look at obviously in detail. 
So how they're diagnosed, um, so the majority with PCR testing, um, which will be your standard swab that everyone's talking about that feels like it's going into your brain, as I'm sure uh, everyone uh, who's had one will appreciate. Um, some people have been diagnosed with typical symptoms on a, a you know, things like a CT scan, which in, in the context of presentation and access to testing um, in the middle of a pandemic is clearly um, an appropriate thing that, that the Chinese um, uh, that the Chinese have, uh, took on board. Uh, now, looking at outcomes, again, 46% uh, were hospitalised. So, um, again, this is we're probably seeing a more severe cohort, and that's just the mechanism of how we're collecting this data. And then 9% um, died in this cohort. So, you know, now what we're interested in is. Uh, you know, what are the things that influence hospitalization? We didn't feel that we had power to look at harder endpoints like death and ventilation, and they are um, currently being worked on in the larger data set, and then we have more power. But you can, you can see uh, in this data set, when we do uh, regression controlling uh, for factors that we think are important, there was no difference, statistically significant difference in odds ratio for um, between the different diseases. Now, you know, we can speculate about what, may or may, what we may or may not see when we increase power, but certainly when we look at the first 600 patients, there is no statistical difference. And the reason that we're not presenting the uh, finer print diseases is because we just don't have the power. That's why we lump them in together into other, um, and we'll be, being more fine scale when we're able to. Um, so here are comorbidities, and I don't think it will be a surprise to anyone based on other data that we've seen from um, general cohorts, that if you've got a comorbidity, um, hypertension, lung disease, then you're more likely um, uh, to be hospitalized because you're, more, um, you're, um, uh, you're at risk of that. There's been some interesting data about smoking, but certainly uh, in our cohort, um, we didn't see a difference in ever smokers in hospitalization. When we look at medications, uh, we, you can see here that um, CSD mods, so you can see down the bottom, those are your methotrexate, leflunamide, hydroxychloroquine, and then a fine, a list of super fine print drugs like azathioprine didn't impact we did not see an impact on hospitalization with hydroxychloroquine. Combining uh, your standard oral DMARs like methotrexate and leflunamide with your um, targeted therapies and biologics, there was no difference on hospitalization. And again, we specifically looked at NSAIDs because of the comments very early on in the pandemic about the, that the French made that they felt like this was a risk. Certainly, with this power uh, in this cohort, we did not see a significant difference. If we look purely at uh, BTSD mods, there was a reduction in the odds of hospitalization and then TNFs uh, alone. So um, again, it's important to remember that this is a selected cohort of potentially severe patients. We don't know what the denominator is, but it certainly doesn't look like these things uh, um, increase your risk uh, of hospitalization. Um, so this is reassuring for the patients out there. I don't think it would come as a surprise to anyone uh, that, um, uh, that prednisone uh, it is a risk in this population. Now, one of the things that our reviewers uh, um, really wanted us to drill down on is often people are on this because of bad disease. So when we put in... Um, uh, disease severity as assessed by physicians. We do not see differences in these um, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the results that we saw. Um, so uh, we see this in, in, in other cohorts as well. And, you know, I don't think this is a huge surprise that um, being on greater than 10 milligrams of prednisone increases your odds of hospitalization. So um, what is our latest data? Um, this is just from the global registry. So we combined, that was combined data. This is from global registry. So this is now the 800. So this is about the half that are sitting in the global registry. And you can see that numbers have really um, risen. Um, 
Uh, we're still getting good uh, numbers on uh, synthetic DMARDs. Um, our bio DMARDs has come down slightly from the earlier reports, but we're still getting good representation. Um, and then this is this, certainly these numbers will grow. Uh, and we're not seeing a huge change in the rates of hospitalization um, and death as, as our numbers grow. And certainly, so I think the take home messages would potentially be that this is reassuring data for our patients. Um, if you wanna get more information or you wanna keep up to date, then I would suggest that you go and have a look at the website. There's certainly, there's data tabs there that you can keep up to date with and you can subscribe and you can have a look at our um, Twitter feed as well. And final thing I wanna say is, um, I really wanna thank everyone that's contributed to this registry and everyone that supported this registry uh, because we would not have this data if we did not have the global buy-in of everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Peter, that was great. Um, I'm sorry, Philip, that was great. Peter's gonna take over now and show us his slides. Again, for the audience, if you have questions, use the Q&A button, not the chat button, and we're gonna to get to questions um, uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes. Dr. Nash. Okay, thank you for the opportunity, Jack. I just wanted to show you um, where um, Philip and I live. You can see we're over here between the sharks and the cyclones. Um, where we've got big spiders and lots of cane toads, but Australia is a very big place. Uh, and the real interest is uh, uh, how that impacts, particularly on telemedicine. We'll talk about that a little bit, eh? So if I can make this slide advance, that would be handy. There we go. So we've become like the plague doctors at the moment. Uh, and um, if only those wet markets wouldn't be eating all those strange animals, now, we've been very lucky in this pandemic. It has not been a major issue to Australia. Australia has free testing, and we've tested one in 20 of our population. And we've ended up with 7,000 cases, but only 100 deaths and over 6,500 recoveries. And that's the split. How many are still in hospital? At the moment, New South Wales 22, hardly any inpatients at the moment. So the country's desperately waiting to reopen. Lots of tests done. Um, we've got 22 million people and they've done over a million tests of which 0.7% have been positive. And you can see how the curve has flattened off uh, and that's the distribution of different states of the country. So to the infection, which state nearly all came from overseas. We had direct flights from Wuhan to Brisbane that they canceled very quickly. The borders were closed. Everyone was tested and isolation happened very quickly. The real question is why we got such a light dose. You know, we don't have extended families living together under one roof. Our population density, except in the middle of the big cities is small. But I was interested in this paper that looked at phylogenetically that there are already three variants of this virus. And Australia had the A variant and France, Italy, Sweden, England, where they've had lots of deaths, had the C variant of this uh, virus. And I just wonder if the natural mutations change virulence significantly. And that's something perhaps we could talk about. Uh, there's a B virus that affected Hong Kong. So we had lots of advice. The Australian Rheumatology Association, the ACR, the BSR. We had lots of advice from our, for our hospitals how you cope with intensive care, who to ventilate, who not to ventilate, et cetera, et cetera. More advice than uh, we actually had patients infected. They tell me if you live in Florida, physical distancing is one alligator length. So what we did was did a lot of screening. <clears throat> Anyone with symptoms couldn't come to the clinic. We did a lot of telemedicine, only seeing the very urgent acute patients face to face. And we did the usual stuff with masks and gloves. We didn't really have an issue getting our hands on those things. They deferred a lots of cases, that should be 400,000. Disinfectant the room, people waited in their cars till they were called in. The issue of hospital discharges and what to do with our therapies and when to go back on therapies, again, is something that we can talk about. But they're always the common questions that our patients had. 
<clears throat> will my medications make me more likely to get COVID? Will it be more severe if I get it? Should I stop all my drugs? Philip's uh, registry is helping us answer some of those questions. What about if I'm on these drugs and I work in a high risk situation like in the hospital, should I go to work or should I not? Who should have swabs and bloods? And when is it safe to restart my medications when I come out of hospital? There are many, many questions and we could uh, think about all of them. But let's talk very briefly about telemedicine because um, we've been doing telemedicine and I listened to Alvin's beautiful presentation. We've had reimbursed telemedicine since 2013 because the government was paying for patients to come down to specialists from out in the bush and that was costing them money. So they thought they would save money by reimbursing telehealth. And there was a long list of things that you had to do. You had to get consent, contact details, everything had to be private, secure, the consultation had to be of a certain type. And then you had to send patient information securely <clears throat> and they had to live a certain distance away, et cetera, et cetera. So telemedicine is not new to us, but I make a plea. We are the only physicians who examine the patients anymore. And I know in the middle of a pandemic, you can't be seeing patients face to face, but please, are we going to be rheumatoid arthrologists or are we going to be physicians of rheumatic disease? Because our patients always tell us, Doc, you are the only one who's laid hands on me in 10 years. And it's what we pick up outside of the joints. It's the thyroid lump, the heart murmur, the enlarged spleen, the funny lymph nodes, what you hear in lungs. We need to not um, give up examination because we're getting reimbursed and it's it's easy to do telemedicine. I might sound like a dinosaur, but I think it's important. And what we've always done for the first visit, pandemic aside, you come down and get seen and examined. Once you're started on therapy, well, fair enough, we can follow you up over Skype. We can follow you up over WebEx, go to meeting, Zoom, and we can look at your joints and et cetera, et cetera. We've got all your blood results. The patients can be taught to do a joint count. They can even be taught to do a DAS 28s and things. Uh, all the software has got all that stuff. We've got the results and you can follow people along, but please don't give up examining our patients. And when you look at some studies on telemedicine, and this is just one of them, would you like to be seen again? One in three said no, they weren't satisfied. Only a half were very satisfied. They do find it convenient, but there's a significant dissatisfaction element. And what they basically boils down to the people who are best for telemedicine are those that have been assessed and are stable, well-established disease, or those with well-established disease having an acute flare that you can handle over the phone or over telemedicine. Um, <clears throat> so we've not seen these beautiful uh, toe things because we don't have enough patients. We've not seen this severe Kawasaki. There's not one case of the Kawasaki-like disease in Australia as far as my pediatric rheumatologists are telling me. Um, but vaccination is something that Australia is very good at. Um, that's my old boss when I was immunology registrar in 1987, 88. Um, and he invented Gardasil. So they've got a very strong vaccine background. Uh, and the Queensland University just got a big grant from the Gates Foundation because they've got a molecular clamp system you take the spike protein off the coronavirus and you make antibodies to it for your vaccine, but that spike protein is unstable. It deteriorates and changes quaternary shape, but this molecular clamp system, which I don't understand the details of, maintains the spike protein, maintains these surface proteins, and you can really make uh, a much more effective vaccine and University of Queensland is working very hard on that and we're into clinical trials. I know Oxford got big ones, all pharma are trying to make them but they've got quite a deal of promise with the UQ vaccine. We still need to know if this vaccine is going to be immunogenic in our patients. Uh, one of the questions about Shindrix for example is its immunogenicity and the same issue will come up um, as far as the COVID vaccine is concerned and, we'll, and Phil's registry will have to help us with that. <clears throat> There's another big Australian trial looking at BCG vaccination. 
uh, in some of the European studies that has not turned out to be protective, but there's a big study going on around Australia. And our Commonwealth Serum Laboratory is also working very hard on convalescent serum to develop a, a treatment for those patients who are hospitalised and very sick, and they're very good at making those kinds of things. Now, the uh, serology will come. What it really means is very difficult to know unless somebody does some decent groundwork. Seroconversion, false negatives, false positives, cross-reactivity, how durable it is. You can see these people coming along with the idea of uh, you're immune because you've got antibodies, but does it really mean that or not, somebody needs to work those details out and I'm hoping the registry will help us. Lots of possible treatment choices. We can't get remdesivir in this country. It's Gilead has made it available to one hospital in Sydney and one hospital in Melbourne in a clinical trial situation. Um, lots of these other things are being looked at. Um, we've been telling our patients like the ACI recommend, do not stop your therapy unless you become proven infected because when you flare, you'll go up on steroid doses and that might be even worse. Um, but what about teaching our students, doing examinations this year on our students, teaching our registrars? Um, how do you accredit this year's advanced training? And Philip alluded to clinical trials. Well, for three or four months, these patients couldn't come in and get assessed in the middle of a clinical trial. We're doing a large number of trials. What do we make with the four to six month gap of data in the middle of that clinical trial? How do you analyze data moving forward? The trials are just starting to recommence now. So um, registrar training, accreditation of advanced training, examinations have all been canceled. Student teaching has all been canceled. What do they do with this year of training? So clearly very challenging, can be alarming, but in our country, manageable, the collaboration is important and we're adapting what we're doing and there is hope out there, Jack. So I, I pass that back over to you. That's just fabulous. Uh, both um, presentations really, really insightful. I want to start with, um, again, the low numbers in Australia. Is there any concern that um, while you may have forestalled um, uh, the peak or helped it go, to go away, do you think that um, your numbers might be, um, might foreshadow a, a, a return to higher numbers at a later date when you open up and whatnot. And it, since you had, you sort of missed the first wave, but you're not immune to the second wave. What's the thinking um, locally? The, politici the politicians are very concerned about a second wave, but as long as international borders are shut, they can't come in, they can't get into the place. And even those affected have recovered and Kevin Winthrop tells me, because I've pinned him down, when can I restart my therapy in someone who's, who's uh, been infected? And he feels that after two negatives and a fortnight, the PCR might be positive, but the virus is no longer viable. It just don't, it, what doesn't last. So the cases in the country, I think, will die out. And then if we don't let international customers in, then I don't think we'll get a second wave for that very reason. Nearly all our cases came in on flights and on cruise ships. The Ruby Princess infected half the country and had 35 deaths. So I've got a feeling that they'll be very concerned, but I've got a feeling as long as the borders are shut, we'll be okay. So uh, Philip, um, any, any um, um, one, your, your registry doesn't include anybody from China and Southeast Asia, and uh, is that a, a weakness? And, um, also, you know, it's also really hard to find any Southeast Asian, you know, experience with COVID and rheumatologic patients. You'd think with all the cases they had in Korea and China and Japan, even that uh, you might have seen some just reports and I've not really been able to find anything. What's your thinking on their omission or what might have been gleaned from those populations? Um, so there are certainly um, different attitudes um, to uh, reporting data around the world. And there are also cultural and language barriers. Um, at the moment, um, we are, uh, we, you know, we are uh, a grassroots organization that up until very recently had zero dollars to help us. And so creating multilingual um, uh, surveys was beyond our capacity. Um, 
Uh, I certainly have, I, I certainly am aware of uh, data coming from China that is not public yet. So um, I think, uh, you know, they have had obviously a huge amount of this and they're just trying to catch up and their priorities was clearly patient care to start with. So um, I think that you'll probably see data from China uh, coming out. Bill, it's almost like our patients are protected. They're getting lesser infection than we would have thought. Is that an impression with any data behind it? And is a 5% death rate higher than the kind of 1% to 2% that everybody claims is the death rate? Or is that just selection in your registry? Look, I'd, I'd love to be able to give you definite answers about that. Um, I, I, look, I get the impression and, you know, it's really nice to get confirmatory data. And um, one, one thing that, um, that, you know, that I have looked at and everyone is very open to look at is to go and look at the secure IBD data and they're on their website. And they certainly seem pretty similar, uh, similar uh, trends to us. And they're, if their paper isn't out yet, it's gonna be out very soon. Um, and they're a different type of patient, clearly, because you know having an entirely swollen large bowel is different from having synovitis in your MCP joints. But um, I think their data, um, their data helps to confirm that this is not an aberration that our data is. I definitely think that we're getting more severe cases. And if that's the case, we're getting more severe cases and our outcomes are slightly worse. Um, it's very hard to be sure about, you know, what, what's going on. Now I have seen, and I'm aware of a non-public data um, that is coming out that uses a denominator and that's what we want. We want, Hey, I look after 10,000 rheumatoid patients or 10,000 rheumatic disease patients. And these are the patients who got infected. Um, there is a preprint out, uh, I know uh, it's out on Med, Med RX, um, uh, that that's out already. And now I know there's other non-public data out. So those are the sort of studies that are gonna help answer that question that, that is really hard to answer from this registry data. So Philip, you know, your data um, shows kind of what the, the New York City report that Jose Sher, Jose Sher showed um, that the patients who were on the more aggressive therapies, biologics and targeted synthetics, were the ones that looked like they were doing better. They were more ambulatory and had seemed to have better outcomes, whereas the ones who were on traditional DMARDs seemed to have a higher number of hospitalizations. Um, that may go to Peter's point that maybe our patients are doing better, especially if they're well controlled and, do, and doing better. What, is, do you have another view of that? Yeah, so certainly that's what we seem to see in the IBD patients and that's what we seem to see in our patients. It, so are we seeing the fact that our therapies are not impairing viral responses, but our therapies are impairing the aggressive immune response that tends to really affect people, you know, in cytokine storm situation? Clearly this is speculation, but, but what fits with biological plausibility um, because that's when people are using anakinra and tocilizumab. They're using it when people get into this uh, horrendous um, uh, over immune stimulation. And if you think that, you know, being on tocilizumab or a JAK or a TNF uh, can, can prevent that happening, then you can prevent the damage that the, your, your own immune system is doing to yourself. So certainly it makes total biological sense. But, you know, as I say, that's, you know, to be determined if that's actually what's going on. But yes, that's certainly a one um, theory that you could take from the data, yes. So this registry, um, uh, one of your numbers said it was 71% female, whereas, you know, most cohort studies, especially the ones who are hospitalized, like many of your patients are, were predominantly male, sometimes even as much as like, you know, 80-20 in favor of males. Um, is that just one reflective of our patient population with autoimmune disease or do you think there's something unique about the number of females that you have? Look, no, I think that probably just reflects the, the, the cohorts of rheumatic disease patients. Um, uh, so I, I don't think that's anything um, separate or different. And I, you know, I would be, I would be slightly worried if we had equal numbers of male and females, because that's not really what we really see in the clinic. So, but 
Um, look, I can see that there's lots of, um, you know, there's totally lots of interest in the, in the different, the finer dissection, right, about this data and, and, uh, and you know, we're all super interested in that as well. And, and, and that's something that, that we can do when we get bigger numbers. So, you know, there's a recent uh, paper put out uh, that we put out that uh, shows that men might be more affected. I think it might be more effective because men are the imbeciles of healthcare. That might be number one. Uh, we like to delay therapy more than anybody else. But also this recent paper saying that men have higher, a, uh, more circulating soluble ACE2 receptors than do women. Um, anybody else have a theory as to why men are um, having the worst forms of disease and the worst outcomes? Smoking, comorbidities, hard to know. Yeah, it really is. There's just so many, you know, if you look across the world, there is just so many uh, non-medical factors that you can think of, you know, socio-cultural factors, access to healthcare, all of these other things that it's just so hard to sort of try and, try and you know, fit a, a theory that, that captures them all, right? So, um, as I said before, this is, this is such an... Um, such a uh, such an important area, but it, you know the pandemic makes it so hard to collect great information about it. So, do you do you foresee that the registry data can be used to show that that you know lupus by itself may not be a risk factor, but lupus plus two comorbidities now puts you into another category? Um, I think that's what people are kind of worried about amongst their patients who they have to advise. Yeah, look, and I think one of the important things to think about is that when you have a rheumatic disease patient, everyone focuses on the rheumatic disease or, or the drug that they're on. And I think our data is potentially um, is able to say, well, look, from the rheumatic disease point of view, I don't think that there are significant asymmetrical risk based on the data, based on the limitations. But clearly, all the things we know from the large cohorts are important as well. So, you know, age and comorbidity and, and, and other things as well. So you can get really hooked up on what you think might be important. But it's so really valuable to think about, look, you're elderly, you've got comorbidities. That may be having a much greater impact on your risk of a poor outcome than being on methotrexate or, you know, your TNF inhibitor. So, you know, again, your registry does uh, sort of coincide with some other um, cohort data that's out there showing that there's that the people that are being enrolled have there's like just a few that are on JAKS. Can you make much out of that? Does that mean maybe the patients uh, on JAKS are protected or just that it's an underrepresentation due to a low amount of use of JAK inhibitors uh, in general? Yeah, look, the, the JAK question is really interesting because clearly there's been discussion about whether JAK inhibitors might in fact be protective. Um, and the, the fact we haven't teased out the JAK data is purely a numbers data, as numbers thing, uh, because uh, we, we as, a, as a group of uh, academics and clinicians, number one, do not want to do harm. And if you start analyzing super small data sets and start drawing conclusions off that. We are worried that we are going to send people down the wrong track. And I think that the pandemic has well demonstrated that people take academic papers straight into the clinic during this pandemic or straight into the ward. And so we need to be careful about that. So that's something front of mind for us. And that's something that we'll clearly be looking at with this paper that will be, um, that's being worked on right now of around 1800, potentially 2000 patients. Because we're going to have a you know three or four times as many patients to look at. Peter, do you think that the IL seventeen inhibitors poses uh, a different risk, or is or is apparently or possibly as beneficial as the IL six and the TNF inhibitors in our patients? Well, I was approached by both of the big IL seventeen companies to do trials because they're so convinced that seventeen. Uh, is part of the cytokine storm that they wanted to look hard to see if uh, suppression was helpful rather than uh, you know detrimental. So uh, I, I think that um, in our hands we've not we've been using them for six seven years. We've not seen much in the way of the usual bacterial infection that you see with the TNFs. A little bit of fungal, okay, but you know I think it'll be a safe drug to choose in this situation. As far as other things and complications are concerned, just a question of whether suppressing 17 
is worthwhile or not. I, my gut feeling is it will be. Um, a number of the uh, audience, including uh, um, Catherine Dow wants to know about, can you be more granular on the people who died? Um, what was it about them that made us stood out from those who didn't die that are in the registry? Do you, do you have an analysis of that at this point? Uh, no, not at this point. We, had, we, didn't, we didn't feel that we had the power to look at death, but that is being worked on right now. So uh, rest assured, that is something that is important to us. Um, we felt that we were able to power for hospitalization in this analysis, uh, and we are looking at death and ventilation in the next one. But do you know if death is cardiac or respiratory or renal? You got a feel for that? Yeah. Look, one of the one of the real um, decisions that we made early on was, you know, we could give people, um, uh, you know, we wanted to we wanted to collect data and we wanted to collect data fast. And asking for too much detail, we felt would mean that we wouldn't get any data. So essentially, we had to make some calls. Right? We had to decide. Well, we're not going to ask about this. We are going to ask about this. And that just meant that we got the data set that we've got. I think we'd all love to have much more detail, but I think that we would have a fraction of the cases. So um, so we don't have that data. Okay. Peter, um, Frank Wellborn in Houston says, thanks for your comments on telemedicine. He agrees with you. Rooms are the best um, clinicians in the world. And uh, our ability to touch has uh, obviously distinguished us. Um, what is your experience, uh, either of you, on um, telemedicine and the virtual joint exam? Um, what can you say other than when it's really good, it's fine, and when it's really bad, it's it's good? But you know, what are the wh where is it real? The virtual joint exam um, really helpful, uh, and where does it fail you, Peter? Well, I think um, with a bit of help with your biologics nurse or your nurse educator, they can examine their joints reasonably well. They're not so good at swelling because they, they can't distinguish, this has been studied in PSA, they can't distinguish a hepatitis node is swollen from a synovitis in a joint. So they're not so great on swelling. They're very good at pain and tenderness. And really it's just one of those measures that you take into account with the ESR and the CRP and bloods and everything. So. I don't think we have an issue that the joint count will make or break our management decisions. I'm really kind of interested that we shouldn't miss other serious disease because we don't examine these patients. Um, again, another question about um, uh, when to resume meds, especially biologics. But you now, before we get into that, let me ask you blank, point blank, what are you telling your patients if they get infected? If that patient gets infected, positive test, not, it doesn't matter, to me it doesn't matter if you're in the hospital or not, are you telling them to stop their biologic or not? At the moment, I'm telling them do not change your current prednisone dose, that's like 30, 40% of patients. I'm telling them to stop and to stay in touch and if they flare, then we have to pick up the pieces. Um, I'm hoping that with evidence we can say, continue your TNF because if anything in Philip's data, it looks protective to be on the TNF. Um, I'm hoping same with IL-6 inhibition, a uh, Plaquenil you can stay on. So at the moment we're saying to stop and get, stay in touch. And if you flare, then we have to decide what to restart. What about you, Phil? Um, look, uh, I, look, I'm in the, um, Good position that I haven't had any of my personal um, patients uh, in either setting I work have this, um, but it, you know I I'm I'm telling all my patients currently to stay on their current therapies because the risk is low. If they get infected, um, uh, look, th this data is very reassuring, um, but the thing is that this data cannot tell us uh, is what. And, and, and this is one of the decisions we've made, what actually happens at the coalface? Have these patients, I know they've been on their biologics up to a time that they've been infected, but have they actually stopped them or have they continued them? I've certainly seen non-public data to say that there's a number of patients that have continued on their medications uh, and, uh, during this time. Um, and, 
and you know, and based on this data, I think that's reassuring. Um, I, I would also look that probably changes based on the the therapy they have, and and look, I would be it would be based on underlying disease and probably severity of their complicate um, severity of their infection. But I think the reality is is that unless you're using a short a short term agent, um, something like etanercept, then lots of these drugs are still sitting around, right? You're on golimab or adalimumab or rem, uh, you know, uh, infliximab. These drugs are still sitting around whether you stop them or not. So, um, uh, and, and, and so that, that is partly the question is taken out of our hands. Um, what do you think about um, Plaquenil? Let's say you get COVID, would you take Plaquenil? Um, so um, if people are interested in, in um, the thoughts that I have on Plaquenil and on the people who are thinking about this at the registry, we've just published a paper in uh, a correspondence to Annals of Rheumatic Diseases. The, the take home from my understanding and my thoughts and discussions with clinical pharmacologists is you probably need to be on much higher doses than what we use in rheumatology to really make any difference. And the risk benefit of that changes substantially. So to answer your question, I don't think I would go on hydroxychloroquine if I got infected because I'm totally unconvinced by the data. Would I go on it for prophylaxis? No. Would I go on it for treatment? Probably not. But certainly, the, the thing is, is that if you have to go on, you know, 1,200 or 1,600 milligrams, everything changes. Your risk benefit changes. And we don't have good data to say that's, a effective or even safe and uh, you know based on the people the way that people have been using it it's not a home run regardless of what certain people have said so i think you know you, you're in uncharted waters so we we get a lot of ross river virus here, a lot of arbo viruses and we're working with qimr years ago for a vaccine and uh, they were saying that if they put chloroquine into the test tube they kill ross river virus which is an rna virus but it's pharmacological dosing, which is exactly what Phil's saying. And I wouldn't take it because the dose you need is very high. And, you know, 1,600 milligrams, again, it might be arbitrary, um, but that's what they're using and not showing major effect. So at this stage, I would say no. So um, everyone's looking forward to a return to some degree of work as we once knew it. And the question is, how are you each going to approach um, um, the return to work. What are your what are you, what are the rules that you're looking to employ um, to encourage patients to come back to face to face meetings? Well, in our country, you need to catch up with people reasonably frequently to continue reimburse therapy. So, in a way, we've got a control over that large group of people. We're still going to do a lot of telehealth. I've got patients in Singapore, Fiji, Darwin, Bali, scattered everywhere. And, you know, you still manage those by telemedicine. People who live eight, 12 hours drive away, you manage by telemedicine anyway. But um, it's the acute, it's the urgent. We'll keep the distancing going. We'll keep some gloves and some masks going for a while. But I, I really think that that'll slowly stop and we'll gradually go back to work and the patients get more and more confident that they're not going to be at risk. Uh, the waiting room's all spread out and social distanced. So I think once you can go back to a restaurant now, 10 people, you know, you can get back into a club and a bar and a cafe, all of that will slowly turn around and change. Yeah, I think, uh, I think having talked to family in the United States that we have, they find it hard to conceptualize the environment that we have here. So I can go to the shops, you know, I can go to a restaurant here, um, recently an, uh, open, but I can go to a restaurant here. Um, I can go to the park, I can put my children on the playground. And so um, to Peter's point, I am now seeing more and more patients face to face because trying to see patients over the telehealth, I, essentially I gave up because I can't do my job if I can't, you know, you might sound like you've got fibromyalgia, you know, maybe you've in fact got, you know, disseminated cancer. And so I just felt that I was helping nobody by seeing patients, um, you know, especially new patients, stable patients, 
who I knew and understood, that's different. But new patients, I, I, I actually gave up because I said, I'm helping nobody here. Um, so I'm seeing more and more, I, I now see new patients face to face because the chance of them having COVID and our hospital screens people at the door, essentially, like a metal detector, but you know, temperature and um, and I make sure that people aren't unwell before they come and see me. I'm seeing patients face to face and more and more, and, and I need to see those ones that I need to do procedures on as well. So um, it's going to return to normal, and that's going to be an individual situation based on your population prevalence and community transmission. Well, many of our audience have has, uh, said great lectures, great session, and they learned a lot. Thank you both for being uh, on this Tuesday night rheumatology. Um, tell your friends, everyone, that we're going to post this on the website tomorrow for all to see. Gentlemen, we'll see you soon. I guess it's time for you to go for your morning run as we go to bed. <laughs> Let's go back to work. Thank you very right. much, Jack. Yeah, thank you very much, Jack. All right, bye-bye.